Cassie Léonce. Today is Wednesday, the 11th of November 2020, and St. Lucia has come to register its first deaths associated to COVID-19. Uh, we are coming to you live from Parliament Building as we will be seeing the continuation of the House of Assembly proceedings today, coming off of yesterday's proceedings. Meantime, I just want to bring you the latest developments out of the government of St. Lucia and we're leading with the developments out of uh, the COVID-19 situation. As I mentioned earlier, we so far registered two new, two, the first two uh, cases, two fatalities of COVID-19 here in St. Lucia. We will be hearing from the Chief Medical Officer, Dr. Sharon Belmont george uh, getting some more details on these two cases. And also, we have registered seven more cases of COVID-19 in the last 24 hours. We will also be hearing the details to that as well. Uh, we will be having a statement from the Executive Director of the Respiratory Hospital on the conditions at the hospital. We know that construction uh, is supposed to be happening there to ensure that it is at full at capacity as soon as possible. We're seeing the increase in cases. and. Uh, also the relocation to the uh, other facility at the Millennium Heights grounds. So, so uh, do stay tuned for those developments and more coming up right after this break. If you're just joining us, a special good morning to you. We are uh, at the Parliament building in downtown Castries today for the continuation of parliamentary proceedings, a sitting of the House of Assembly coming off of yesterday's uh, proceedings. And also we are registering New cases of COVID-19, and the more unfortunate, the first registered deaths of the novel coronavirus here in St. Lucia. Stay with us. Coronavirus? But children are safe, no? Hold up. Children are actually more likely to touch all kinds of surfaces, put their hands on their mouths and their eyes, or sneeze and cough with little thought about hygiene when around others. While children have been seen to recover well from this virus, they can easily spread it to those more at risk, like the elderly or ill persons who have a weaker immune system. Teach the little ones in your care to be little powerhouses of infection prevention. Keep reminding them, wash, wash, wash your hands. Cover your mouth with tissue or your inner elbow when you sneeze and cough. And be sure to praise them when you see them taking these precautions. Our health is in our hands. Together, through simple actions, we can stop the spread of coronavirus. This message was brought to you by the Bureau of Health Education of the Ministry of Health and Wellness. Thank you so much for staying with us. We're coming to you live today, Wednesday, the 11th of November, 2020, from Parliament Building in downtown Castries, as we await the uh, proceedings of uh, the House of Assembly continuing from yesterday the 10th of November. In the meantime, we will be bringing you the latest developments coming from the government of St. Lucia. The island has recorded its first COVID-19 fatalities. Health officials announced yesterday, 10th November, that two individuals have since succumbed. We will be uh, getting into that in just a moment. Uh, we also had recorded seven additional cases of COVID-19 here on island yesterday. And just to give you a timeline of events, we got the first word from health officials of the uh, case number 142. That's the 27-year-old male from Castries. And then subsequent to that, we had the first COVID-19, word of the first COVID-19 death here in St. Lucia coming in from health officials at 3.24 p.m. on the 10th of November yesterday. And cases number 143 to 148, that's six cases, additional cases, were, uh, con the information was conveyed to the media later on in the day. And uh, at 9.15 p.m., uh, we got word of the second COVID-19 death. Uh, we now go to a statement uh, coming from the Chief Medical Officer, Dr. Sharon Belmont-George, on the first COVID-19 fatality here in St. Lucia. The Ministry of Health and Wellness, today, Tuesday, November 10th, 
2020 received confirmation of the first COVID-19 death in country. The individual is a 47-year-old male from the Miku district. He presented at one of our hospitals due to the complications of underlying medical conditions where he was treated and being managed for these issues. As part of his care, he was also assessed and swapped for COVID-19 and his results returned today as positive for the virus. Investigations and contact tracing in relation to this case are currently ongoing. The Ministry of Health and Wellness, we extend our greatest sympathies to his family and loved ones. This is indeed a difficult time for them and this loss is also being felt by us within the Ministry of Health. The Ministry of Health and Wellness, we will continue providing updates as information becomes available. So that's word there from the Chief Medical Officer, Dr. Sharon Belmont-George, alerting us to uh, the first COVID-19 fatality registered here in St. Lucia. A 47-year-old male from the Miku district it did indicate that he presented at one of the hospitals due to complications of an underlying medical condition uh, where he was assessed and swabbed for COVID-19. And his results returned today well, that was yesterday as positive for the virus investigations and contact tracing in relation to this case are currently ongoing. And we do ask for a compliance and a level of cooperation in the various communities that the Ministry of Health does go into as this is a very serious matter and contact tracing efforts are critical, crucial at this point in time. Uh, the second COVID-19 death uh, to be registered, uh, we did not get a statement from the CMO, however, we got a press release and that came in at 9.15 p.m. That was last night, the 10th of November. The Ministry of Health, and I'm just reading from the press release, Tuesday, November 10th, 2020, the Ministry of Health received confirmation of its second death of COVID-19. The individual is a 78-year-old male from the Grosely District. He had presented to a healthcare facility where he was treated for COVID-19. He was placed in isolation at the Respiratory Hospital. And on Sunday, November 7th, 2020, results were received confirming a COVID-19 diagnosis. While at the facility, the patient required critical care and contact tracing in relation to this case was undertaken and close contacts have been tested and where required have been placed into care. The Ministry of Health extends its sympathy to the family of the individual who uh, are going through this loss at the, of this love, their loved one at this point in time. The loss is also felt within the Ministry of Health. And definitely, uh, we at the GIS extend a sympathy to the family and loved ones of the two individuals who succumbed to the novel coronavirus. And at this point in time, we just want to alert you to additional cases of COVID-19 that have been registered. Yesterday was a significant in our COVID-19 experience for the deaths, but St. Lucia continues to register additional cases of COVID-19. We had the case number 142 being registered yesterday. That was the first release coming from the Ministry of Health for the day, a 27-year-old male from Castries. And subsequent to that, we did have a press release from the Ministry of Health indicating that six more individuals had contracted COVID-19. And just to reference the press release for you, we have case number 143, a 47-year-old male from the Miko district, 144, a 32-year-old male from the Castries district, case number 145, a 40-year-old female from View Fort, uh, case number 146, a 69-year-old male from the Castries district, case number 147, a 59-year-old male from the Grosley district, and case number 148, a 40-year-old male from uh, the Lavery uh, district. Uh, this brings the total number of cases in Ireland to date at 148. We've had 148 cases at this point in time and uh, so far registering two new deaths. We do have uh, epidemiological links that have been identified today. 
and uh, as a result the Ministry of Health is indicating that it is conducting contact tracing uh, to ensure and try to determine the extent of the COVID-19 uh, situation here on island. Uh, we now go to a statement coming from the Executive Director Nancy Francis of the Respiratory Hospital just speaking on conditions there, we know that efforts have been made to relocate some of the COVID-19 patients as they continue to receive care. A construction has been interrupted to ensure the full capacity of the institution. So we now go to uh, Nancy Francis for an update on the situation at the hospital. The Department of Health and Wellness notes the concerns of the general public as it relates to recent video footage highlighting the conditions of a temporary lodging area for patients at the respiratory hospital. We appreciate the heightened awareness by the public of the seriousness of the COVID-19 pandemic and how the Department of Health and Wellness is responding to this constantly evolving health concern. It is very unfortunate that some patients had an initial negative experience at the hospital. On behalf of the management and staff of the hospital, I take this opportunity to apologize and to assure the public that we aim to provide all patients with the highest level of care in a safe, clean, and comfortable environment. As discussed in previous press statements, we are working assiduously to address the infrastructural upgrades at the respiratory hospital, which include complete renovation of approximately 50 beds, and in some instances, the installation of individual bathroom facilities to meet WHO standards for COVID-19 patients. Other works include painting, installation of ventilation system and an upgrade of the sewer and wastewater systems. Unfortunately, while we were busy ensuring that the infrastructural works were complete, there was an increase of COVID-19 patients in country which severely disrupted the project, resulting in incomplete works in some areas. We had to quickly admit patients at the hospital while simultaneously continuing with the said infrastructural works in a safe and conducive manner for all concerned. This was further exacerbated by the heavy rainfall over the last two weeks. The heavy rains resulted in leaks, water seepage, and other wet conditions at the respiratory hospital. Our maintenance and technical teams have done their best to manage the leaks and water seepage. However, dry weather is needed for this to be adequately addressed. Some of the challenges we encountered during the early stages of preparing for the COVID-19 pandemic were 1. Dietary services Our meals were transferred from our main kitchen at OKUH to the respiratory hospital. As a result, we received complaints from patients indicating that meals were late and cold. I am happy to inform that we have reopened the kitchen at the respiratory hospital. We have a talented culinary and dietary services team who ensures that all meals meet the therapeutic nutritional standards for each patient. Two. Linen services. Linen was a, also a major challenge. This was as a result of servicing two hospitals and supply chain logistics due to closure of borders. We have since received a shipment of linen and have adjusted our linen management services to eliminate the shortage of linen. Three, telecommunication. The construction and renovation works compromised our network and telecommunication infrastructure. This severely affected our fixed line service. We are working with the telecommunication service provider to rectify the problem. To date, 
we have restored the telecommunication service in some areas and have an information desk manned with trained personnel to provide information to the general public. This service is available from 7 a.m. to 6 p.m. and will soon be extended to 9 p.m. Wi-Fi service has also been upgraded and is available free of charge. 4. Drop-off service. This is a new service offered by the hospital to facilitate the submission of supplies to patients by their loved ones. We encourage the public to adhere to the recommended drop-off times to ensure the timely distribution of supplies to patients. The drop-off times are 7 a.m., 12 noon, and 5 p.m. daily. Our hard-working staff are dedicated and on many occasions go beyond the call of duty to ensure that all our patients receive the best quality care. I take this opportunity to thank the team and to encourage them to continue to give their best while keeping themselves and their families safe. Finally, we welcome the concerns and feedback from the general public. However, I urge everyone to channel the much appreciated concerns and recommendations to us by calling the Respiratory Hospital Information Desk at 458-6526 or email respiratoryh at govt.lc. We are in this together. We need the nation to work with us as we lead out in managing this pandemic. Thank you. That word there from Nancy Francis, the executive director at the Respiratory Hospital, just giving us an understanding, an outline of the works that are ongoing at the Respiratory Hospital. We know that they're, they're working assiduously to address certain matters in terms of construction, the installation of 50 beds, and in some cases to meet the World Health Organization standards of including bathroom facilities, uh, there's painting happening, the installation of ventilation systems, and the upgrade of wastewater and sewage systems are happening right now as St. Lucia's uh, cases of COVID-19 continue to rise. Uh, we did have the two deaths reported here uh, as a result of COVID-19, but we have so far seen 15 recoveries of COVID-19. And at this point, that has reduced the number of uh, individuals in active care at the res respiratory hospital. So please take note of that. The total number of cases we've registered of COVID-19 to date, 148. We've registered our first two fatalities, our first fatalities, that was November 10th yesterday, uh, a 47-year-old male. And we do extend our sympathies to the families and the loved ones of these two souls. We continue with news this morning. We just want to remind those of you who are just joining us today that we are coming to you live on NTN from Parliament Building uh, for the continued proceedings of the House of Assembly. And uh, coming off of yesterday, the coming off of yesterday, we had uh, the details of expenditure undertaken to procure goods and services under the state of emergency was provided to the House of Assembly by the Prime Minister and Minister for Finance, Economic Growth, and Job Creation, External Affairs and the Public Service, Honorable Alan Shastney. So he did address that matter in the Honorable House yesterday. The Prime Minister explained that the detailed report was part of the government's efforts to ensure full transparency and full and public accountability at the presentation provided as the uh, presentation provided justification for the procurement activities pertaining to the COVID-19 national response. Uh, the Prime Minister and Minister for Finance explained that while the waiver uh, for the application of any rule of law governing procurement was never utilized and no such 
order was issued by the Minister of Finance. The report presents the data compiled on the procurement of goods and services for COVID-19 during the state of emergency, which was declared on March 23rd, 2020. We go to uh, now a clip from the Honorable Prime Minister, Alan Shastney, from yesterday's proceeding of Parliament. We spent about $3.2 million on medical equipment, $1.5 million on personal protective equipment, $1.1 million for medical materials and supplies for testing, $890,000 for airfare lodging accommodation for the Cuban Medical Brigade, accommodation for persons in quarantine and isolation centers, $4.6 million, retrofitting of health facilities, $550,000, water tanks, $1.1 million, computers and equipment to facilitate e-learning, $2.3 million. The total is fifteen million three hundred and eighty nine thousand four hundred and fifty dollars. Principal of factors, the Prime Minister explained that the determine did determine the selection of the suppliers of the goods and services. Uh, it was the ability of the suppliers to deliver the goods in the requisite short time, the existing relationship with suppliers and the suppliers' willingness to accept more flexible payment arrangements and extend more favorable credit terms at a minimal cost so that was the honorable prime minister there speaking uh, yesterday just giving the details of all expenditure undertaken to procure goods and services under the state of emergency we continue with news now the minister of with responsibility for transport honorable guy joseph says his office and the department of transport has been in constant dialogue with the driving schools association on how best they can be served by the department as well as operated during the COVID-19 pandemic. On Monday, the association did voice their displeasure with a recent decision by the department to suspend practical driving tests. We have Honorable Guy Joseph saying that the department is not creating unnecessary hurdles to affect the livelihoods of its members. However, there have been serious concerns expressed by examiners about their safety and the lack of adherence to the COVID-19 protocols. We now go to our first clip of the morning from Honorable Guy Joseph. The report from the examiners was that they did not feel safe going into the vehicles with people having their mask under their chin, the vehicle not being properly sanitized, and the position was that if they felt vulnerable, then they were putting themselves at risk. It was on that basis we said, can we do a suspension? Because it meant that they, they had the option of downing their tools and saying we are not working in this environment. And they actually cited the part of the labor code that they would invoke in order to do so. So we are not in normal times and normal situations. So we are dealing with the matters as they come. So what we've said is that we need to put measures in place to be able to deal with the situation. I know we've had training with the driving schools to go on the DigiGov platform because the theory exam and a lot of the other things pertaining to driving schools, they are available on the DigiGov platform. In my discussions with the president, maybe less than half of the driving schools have availed themselves with that platform that can help their business. So the only part that is affected temporarily is the actual driving exam itself. You know how far we went into the discussion at the department to come up with solutions? Minister Joseph says the department is now offering several services through the DigiGov platform. As such, these services at this time are not being offered in office. The report from the examiners was that they did not feel safe going into the vehicles with people having their mask under their chin, the vehicle not being properly sanitized, and the position was that if they felt vulnerable, then 
They were putting themselves at risk. It was on that basis we said, can we do a suspension? Because it meant that they, they had the option of downing their tools and saying we are not working in this environment. And they actually cited the part of the labor code that they would invoke in order to do so. So we are not in normal times and normal situations. So we are dealing with the matters as they come. Coming so, towards the end of November, early December, we usually, there, there's an agreement with the driving schools that have been in effect for many years that you stop practical exams during that time until you recommence in January. So in essence, it would just be a, a couple of weeks or two to three weeks of not having practical exams. We have not been involved in whether instructors will continue to instruct their students. That is a decision to be made between the student and the instructor. I know we've had training with the driving schools to go on the DigiGov platform because the theory exam and a lot of the other things pertaining to driving schools, they are available on the DigiGov platform. In my discussions with the president, maybe less than half of the driving schools have availed themselves with that platform that can help their business. So the only part that is affected temporarily is the actual driving exam itself. So that word there from the Minister of Transport, Honorable Guy Joseph, that's giving an update and encouraging persons to make use of the DigiGov platform. Uh, we just want to round off the morning of updates coming from the government of St. Lucia uh, before we uh, stand by for the commencement of uh, the House of Assembly proceedings. If you're just joining us, a special good morning to you. We'd like to thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, we are live on air and online, channel 122, Facebook, and YouTube channel. If you're watching uh, from the diaspora, good morning to you as well and well wishes globally. St. Lucia has hit a curve in its COVID-19 experience. We read our first case of COVID-19 yesterday, it was Tuesday the 10th of November. And uh, so far we've seen another case of a COVID-19 fatality bringing the, the number, the total number as it stands to two fatalities of COVID-19 registered. We have 101 active cases of COVID-19 and the total number of uh, cases of COVID-19 we've registered on Ireland to date stands at 148. We encourage persons to uh, please use and, and make use of the infection prevention measures, the guidelines that have been put out there by the Ministry of Health, the health officials here in St. Lucia. It is to protect members of the population at this time. St. Lucia has registered these two deaths of COVID-19 and you know if not before we hope that those who have not as yet do now take things seriously the washing of hands with soap and water the use of hand sanitizer the physical distancing you know the six feet apart you know the use of the mask these things are very cheap they, they cost so little and they can save lives Please play your part at this time as we try to protect our COVID, our population from COVID-19. Things are, are, you know, getting more and more serious day by day. We're seeing second waves of the pandemic in other countries and the, the Ministry of Health is trying to get a hold and, and manage COVID-19 spread here in St. Lucia and they need your help. They need my help. They need our help uh, to try to contain uh, this virus here in St. Lucia. So we hope you're doing your part. Remember, it could be your family member. Think of your children. Uh, think of your the elders in your family who uh, continue to enjoy life, who continue uh, to, uh, you know, 
contribute meaningfully you know even our workforce right now the last thing that St. Lucia needs is to be crippled uh, by this uh, virus and so we encourage everybody to play their part play their part and make use of the infection prevention measures at this point in time we do have a parliament uh, reconvening today resumption of parliament sitting house of assembly and we're coming to you live from downtown castries we're going to go back to studio just brought you the latest developments from the government of saint lucia uh, but as soon as uh, the speaker of the house makes his entrance we will be uh, resuming uh, the house of assembly proceedings coming into wednesday the 11th of november 2020 my name is jesse leon signing off for now and in just a moment we will be back so stay tuned to ntm